Dear teachers, um, after learning about another concept of how to solve populism uh, from our predecessors, we now welcome you to our approach on European integration and the rise of national populist parties. My name is Toby and this is Luca and we are members of the Yes to Europe team from the whole Landesschule in Hanau. Um, we are nine students from Hesse, part of the advanced class of Politic and Econ Economic Science. Um, and in order to enhance our solution finding process, we were supported by Sebastian Blesse and Thomas Raab from the Center for European Economic Research in Mannheim. At this point, we want to thank you for your cooperation. At school, as well as in the news, we all were confronted with several populist and nationalist thoughts, which endanger the stability of European unity. For example, we experienced Donald Trump winning the presidential election in the US, Marine Le Pen making huge gains in France, the AfD entering several parliaments in Germany, and last Sunday the Bundestag, and last but certainly not least, the decision to leave the European unity in the, uh, in the UK. How I already said, Mr. Donald Trump is a good example to explain populism. During his campaign before the elections in America, he promised that he aims to build a wall to Mexico. This wall would cost about $22 billion, and he assured that he will make the Mexicans pay for it. Another false claim and pure populism. Mr. Trump is also convinced that global warming is fake news. He quit the Paris Climate Agreement and claims that global warming is needed because it gets too cold in New York. Due to the Brexit referendum, you can see that most of the younger people decided to remain. In contrast to that, the older voters from the age of 65 and plus were tended to vote for Brexit. But how did it happen that the UK as a whole decided to leave? Take a look at this statistic. Only 36% of the younger people went to the ballot box, but almost 90% of the senior citizens participated in the, refer in the referendum. Say, Luca, how is the situation in Germany? Especially in Germany's demography, it is undeniable that the elder generations grow in numbers and therefore in political influence. The significance of the elders in Germany is already very high and will further increase in the future. Nearly a quarter of the German citizens are seniors, yet they are unnoticed by political education. There are so many workshops and programs for schools, but almost nothing for a group of growing senior citizens. And to conclude our research, we can say that the younger people, they tend to trust the EU, yet are not encouraged to participate in elections which renders their political influence to a minimum. The older people participate in large numbers but have a more skeptical view on the EU. Due to their small media competence and a lack of workshops for older people, they are more likely to fall for populist claims. The media does not succeed in selecting trustworthy information and often polarize political situations. So the voters have to go out of their way to get well informed. And this information partly spread throughout media, complicates the process of developing a political opinion and is a key factor in spreading populist statements. And to solve their problems, we as a group came to the conclusion that it is necessary to motivate the young citizens while offering trusty information to the elders. To deliver on that, we offer workshops in senior residences as well as in schools to guarantee a flawless flow of information. This is a great starting point from which we aim to spread political awareness throughout the generations. We acknowledge that senior citizens don't often use modern media like online research. This was further proven by feedback from the inhabitants of the multi-generation house in our neighborhood where we first tried out our workshops. There we came together and um, started a light chat about the EU. While some seem, seem skeptical at first, they later began talking about their ch uh, children or grandchildren who profit greatly from free traveling and good telephone connections provided by the EU. We believe in information through conversation and interaction, not only on an online but also on a personal level. 
and we do not stop there. We spark the attention of federal agency for civic education who endorse our ideas and actions. Axel Knoblich, who is director at this agency, told us that he endorses our work and acknowledges that this is a real market gap. But what do we actually do in these workshops? We do a variety of activities. A quiz to get to know the current information status. We also make puzzles which act as a conversation starter. We discuss nowadays political matters, and most importantly, we confront the audience with the political program, for example, of the AFD, and encourage them to ponder about the con consequences of populist government. What will change in our everyday life if, for example, the AFD runs our government? We know that most of the students who participate in our workshops are not able to vote yet. However, we aim to motivate them to develop an educated political opinion. Is it like an investment in the future? Exactly. For example, we hosted the European Day on the 9th of May to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the European Union and to playfully inform our fellow students about advantages as well as problems of the EU. Yes, many students were shocked by the real program of the AFD. They were indeed. We also contributed to the introduction of the Bundestag deputies in front of more than 1,200 students, we questioned their claims and asked about their opinion on populism and the future of the European Union. But outside school, the students seem uninterested in chatting about politics. Indeed, and we are also conscious of that, which is why, became, which is why we became bookable to bring our workshops to your school. Right here, <laughs> you can connect us just right now in just one click. We know that it is unrealistic to assume that only nine students from Hesse could solve populism. However, with our content and materials available online, everybody is able to hold their very own workshop. So it's like we aim to be the spark that lights the fire. In order to be a spark even the youth burns for, we developed a mobile application. Imagine it like the Valomart but backwards. You enter in your party of choice and get asked questions based on the political program of that party. For example, if you choose the FDP, you will be asked about your opinion on taxes as well as digitalization to find out if your opinion truly matches with that party. But now it is time to act. First, allow political matters to enter your everyday life and second, Share your knowledge to enable comprehension of consequences of populist decisions and reintegrate the European mindset by participating in elections. Third, spread our ideas and book our workshops. And fourth, if you endorse a beneficial future, vote for us to ensure information and awareness of every citizen, no matter the age, to further ensure the downfall of national populist parties. We are convinced that the political future is a digital and enlightening future. But this will only work if you give us your vote. So thank you for your attention, and we look forward to learn about the ideas of our competitors. Thank you, Tobias and Luca. I'm happy to welcome Annika and Philip from your team for the discussion. At the same time, I am happy to, yes. I am happy to have two familiar faces from the last session here uh, with me. That is uh, Nora Hesse and Gerhard Zeuka. And we welcome our new guest, Henrik Müller, who is a professor at um, TU Dortmund. He is a professor for journalism and he was previously the deputy editor in chief of the Manager magazine. Welcome, Henrik Müller. All right, so I think we start off um, discussing this um, political future app by starting with some questions from our experts. What do you think? Is this the solution to address rising populism in Europe? Ladies first. Okay, I'll try it with the cube this time. 
Um, I would like to start first of all saying that I'm really, I find it really amazing how many people in this room, how many students, young people are interested in economics and politics and I think you all need to be um, uh, applauded for this and um, I want to you know, give you some positive feedback before I ask my first question, which is probably too obvious to begin with. But um, I think it's good that you asked the question first, what is populism? Uh, and you described it uh, the way you understand it in, in, um, in your presentation. And um, it's good that you did, did your research. I think that's, um, uh, uh, yeah, well done. <laughs> Um, my question, as I said, is probably too obvious, but why not just the Valomat? Why should I use the Political uh, Future app, especially if I'm uh, undecided on who I want uh, to vote for? Uh, isn't it better just to answer the questions first and then have an idea which political parties I might vote for? Because I'm thinking that if I already know that I want to vote for the SPD or CDU, why, like, why would I even go to the Political Future app in this case? Gonna gather a couple of questions. That's okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying the cube. Oh, it, it sounds good. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, listening to that. Uh, one question: um, You have mentioned you're doing workshop, and from what I understand, you're planning to do more workshops. A very simple question, uh, which also probably comes from my perspective, is: um, Are you receiving any funding or? Do you have any resources if you plan to make uh, workshops in the longer run? How will you educate yourself, your team? Um, what about the time? Where do the people take the time from? Um, do they not go to school or have a job? I mean, th these are all questions which are coming up. For me, for example, being here today means I'm missing a day of work. Do just, well, this is the microphone, okay. Um, yeah, um, thanks for this great presentation. It uh, certainly tackles um, an immediate uh, problem as we've seen, and an urgent pr problem as we've seen uh, in the recent elections in, uh, in Germany too. Um, I have one basic question, and it, it has to do with the, or as far as I understand the nature of populism, and that is that populism from my point of view, is, uh, is really a rational phenomenon, um, meaning that um, uh, uh, it is rational for some people to follow populist leaders and for media to follow populist leaders and to cover populist leaders because it's so easy. They tell an easy story and it's easy to grasp. And this is, uh, and so there is, um, and this is what you're running into with your app uh, idea too. There is a fierce competition for the time of voters. Uh, you have the entire, um, the entire world at your, at the reach of your thumb on your smartphone. So how do you want to get people to actually spend some of their precious time and their scarce time budgets uh, to to spend with your app? Thank you very much. Would you reply? Um, first, the question was why using our app instead of just using the Valomat. It's a good question, but with our app, you, or let me start differently, with the Valomat, you get the same, I think, 38 questions all the time. But with our app, you first chose your party of choice, and then you get specific questions based on the program of that party so it's more specific and not just general when my experience with the Valomat was I answered the questions and I had I think like five or six parties that were almost the same percentage which didn't really help me I mean I have a political opinion but if I didn't have one this would this wouldn't really help me but I think if you use our app you get a more specific answer to your question. Um, this can also be applied to the very second question, uh, why I should even bother if the, I already have a political opinion. Uh, however, it is that um, our approach is actually aimed at those who already have an idea of who they want to vote for and want to be like, like proven if, if it is really the best for them. Um, for example, I do um, actually uh, think that not even half of anybody who 
I'm so sorry, not even half of anybody who um, votes um, for the AFD uh, has ever read the program or does even know what is in the very program. I didn't know either what was in the party I voted for when um, I first gave um, my votes. However, um, you see it is about um, reproving and um, encouraging the thought, is this really what I want? Um, considering everything the party stands for, and not only like one very plugative one. Um, oh yes, um, actually resources was also, I'm, I'm so sorry, did I mess up the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> However, uh, resources uh, is not a real problem to us because we do not aim to, um, to do those workshops um, solely by ourselves. Um, we aim to be the spark that lights the fire. Uh, we want to encourage youth around Germany and around Europe uh, to do workshops and to participate uh, in the, uh, as we call it, enlightenment um, of uh, the, the, the voters. Um, so basically, uh, how we fund it is not that big of a problem. The material we use is actually, it's, it's free by um, the Federal Agency for Civic Education. Um, so it is basically about a, a kind of movement and um, nothing, uh, nothing in, terms of, in terms of business. Uh, to the, um, to the uh, time resources of uh, the, possible, um, the possible uses of our app, uh, it is to say that while it may seem inconvenient to some that uh, using an app is basically a waste of time, uh, I think um, some people are they're actually considered that reading a party program or getting informed about their own party uh, just before the election is a much larger waste of time than just simply checking an app. much. Just to add up on that, I think um, what we've seen, for instance, in the latest election results was that many people who voted for the AFD were actually voting for the AFD because they were, well, they, they were disappointed by the so-called established parties, right? You have seen all these voter movement charts. So I was wondering if there is such a general dis Mm, disappointment, let's say, with the political system and people are not really, and that is what makes populist parties win votes. How do you get those people actually use such an app? I think it, very, it is a little bit related to what um, Henrik Müller asked before, but are you really getting the people that you want to inspire um, to use this app, is that then really helping to fight populism? That would be my question, but perhaps we're going to collect some more. I was just um, very curious when you presented um, the results of the British vote, if, uh, because I, I didn't look into this, I have to admit. Do you know how older people in Germany voted this Sunday? Like, what is the tendency there, just out of curiosity? No, we, do, we do not have statistics for um, the, this, year, uh, this week's election. I'm no. very sorry. I, ho I also haven't come across this kind of information. So. Possibly it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what we've seen in, uh, in the uh, election uh, last Sunday, and, and this uh, is a question to you too, how do, how do you want to tackle this problem? This problem? Because uh, not all the regions in Germany are as well off as uh, the, uh, the state of Southern Hesse is. Um, what we've seen, and this, is, uh, this was the case uh, in the US and it was the case in the UK, uh, was that it was certain regions um, uh, with the declining aging population. So, and we have, I, I don't, th this is what the results, I, I haven't seen any polls from last Sunday, but uh, there, were, um, uh, there were polls last year from the Bettelsmann Foundation uh, saying that it's, uh, that people uh, uh, that live in declining areas uh, that are uh, older than average are more inclined to, uh, or rather inclined to vote for the uh, AFD and uh, are more afraid of globalization and all the other things that go with it. So, and this is, this is a question I would like to ask. Um, apparently there is some kind of social dynamics at work uh, in certain regions where uh, a feeling of declinism, as they say in France, uh, is, uh, is getting hold. Um, and how do you want to tackle that? You, uh, you come from a point of view, and I find that very refreshing, where you say, well, uh, let's uh, educate people, let's apply it to rationality. 
uh, and uh, inform them and then they will make the right choices. Well, apparently not. Maybe they don't want to get educated because there are some social dynamics at work that hinder them to do so. Yep. Um, maybe one methodological question. Um, how useful do you think is it to use uh, the political platforms of the parties as a basis? Um, personally, I feel that they are more some kind of marketing to promote uh, their like views and, and, and to get people to vote for them. But as we see in, in, in negotiations for coalitions is that very often, very soon after an election, they throw over most of, not, not most, but some relevant parts of their uh, political platforms. So what do you think when, you, when you're building your app based on this? Because if you take the AfD, they will never say something, or they will never write something racist or nationalist in their political platform, or something which is really hard to find. But when you see what they're saying on a public stage, it's very different from what they have written in their political platform. Thank you very much. Um, may, may I just answer to that one directly because it's the, the easiest. Um, true, but the political program of the AFD actually states that uh, only um, citizens who have a certain degree of, um, what is it, German heritage in themselves should become uh, citizens of Germany. This is actually in the official party program. And I do completely understand that sometimes programs are just like thrown over in, case of, in terms of coalition. Um, however, especially in the case of populist parties, uh, at least with the AFD, the program itself um, speaks a lot of um, very, very right-winged, like partially extreme right-winged right -wing, right um, contents. And this is probably a good thing to know if you vote for them. Um, if you not only vote for them because you're uh, discontent with the current state, but, uh, but also um, if, you, if you know what, what would, would actually change and how would it change, and if it would change for the better, if, if I do so. What, what were the other questions again? I'm sorry, I forgot. We had a question about um, search, uh, certain social conditions or dynamics. Social dynamics regions. in certain regions, declining regions, where uh, populist feelings take hold. Um, social dynamics are completely, or do you want to answer? <laughs> I'm so sorry. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we're just nine students from Hesse, mm. so for us, mostly without driver's licenses and cars, it's easier to operate in Hesse and in our region. Of course, there are different social dynamics in different parts of our country, but it it's really hard to influence or to help, help everybody here, so we try to focus on our area and do the things that are possible to us. All right. We had another question of um, your question. I just asked about the older voters in the general. Yeah, yeah, okay, the, so the, okay, good. So I would suggest that we open up for... <laughs> Let's open up. So there are already a couple of questions here. Hi. First of all, amazing presentation. We have some really great speakers. I was impressed. <laughs> um, I do have one issue with your general approach, though. And it is that I think your app and your idea works really well with people with moderate opinions who want to question their moderate opinions, which is a great thing, don't get me wrong, it makes a huge difference if you vote for the SPD or the Green Party, for example, but I do not think that it works with radicals, because, uh, I mean, have you ever tried talking, of course you have, uh, tried talking to, uh, to an AFD voter, or um, even on a left-wing spectrum uh, with, a, with a left party voter, um, it is very, very difficult to convince them. I would even say, especially on the right wing, uh, virtually impossible. And how do you want to reach out to those people? Thank you very much. We're just going to collect the second question right next to you. Okay. Um, so I actually have several questions. So um, the first one is you want to do workshops in schools. and. Um, as far as I know, schools should stay at least to some degree political neutral. So um, how, how, 
how do you even want to implement that there? So you want to do a workshop against one party in our parliament. You can't do that in schools, I'm sorry, but that is not something you can do in a democracy. And um, <laughs> also, how do you guarantee that the information that you tell the people is the right information? So um, you want to do the workshops, but you only get your information from the media, or where do you get that from? So how is that more of the truth than the other truth out there? And truth is pretty, um, well, it's not objective. You can't say there is one truth. truth. And um, the other thing is, I think that most of the people who um, go to these workshops actually don't vo vote for the AFD because if you are interested for that in that, you you don't even vote like that. So I don't think that the real problem could be tackled in doing workshops that people sign up to voluntarily. Okay, thank you very much. We see that. A couple of the themes that we talked about in the first session also come up here. So how do you safeguard neutrality in, when, when starting your enlightenment project in schools? Um, how do you actually deal with those that are very difficult to reach? So your answers to those questions. Um, you, you claimed that um, we would do a workshop against a, uh, a specific party, but that is just not what we actually do. We do inform about what uh, the benefits and the um, the, the, the negative sides of uh, EU membership are, membership are. Like already stated in um, our previous session, um, most people do not know what, how the EU influences their everyday life. Uh, and the workshops are solely about that and not about propaganda against any party. Uh, this is not the topic of any of our workshops at all. Um, to the other questions, it, it was like, like really, really much. Would you be so kind to briefly repeat uh, the second one? Um, how do you guarantee that the information you are giving is right? Because truth is not objective. Um, if truth would be not objective, which, which opinion? Well, at least uh, not in politics. Um, yes, but facts are objective. A truth is a really difficult word. However, facts is simple. If, for example, the UKIP in Great Britain claims that we spend three million pounds a week for the uh, European Union, um, and they ride it on their very bus, on their party bus, and it turns out that it, it's, it's not that number, it's actually uh, about, about half of that, then this is just, this is not a fact, this is a claim, it's, it's wrong. It's, not a lie, but a false fact. Uh, it's about proving facts. Truth, I completely agree. Difficult topic, different topic. However, facts are always objective. Keep in mind that information is always filtered. I mean, even if it's a fact, there is some filter. So I agree that it, it cannot be completely objective. And also keep in mind that, as you mentioned, parties have promises in their program. They don't have so many facts. Yes. Um, I think the, that's an excellent uh, example because it didn't change the outcome of the referendum. Even though the figure was corrected by the uh, Her Majesty's Statistical Office even, uh, so that's uh, the highest authority there is, it didn't change the opinion of many people who already had, had made up their mind that uh, Brexit would be better than staying in the EU. And uh, I think this is uh, the very nature about what you call truth. There probably isn't such a thing as truth, but it's about narratives. And this has a lot to do uh, with how convincing facts really are. What we've seen in the Brexit campaign, what we've seen uh, in the US, is that, uh, uh, that fact-checking, correcting uh, the wrongs that uh, the candidates uh, were, um, were putting to the public didn't actually change uh, the mindset of potential voters uh, because it was more the narrative that, uh, uh, that mattered uh, for forming political opinions. And the narrative of populists, and I, that's what I initially said, is, is an attractive one because it's so simple. It's simplistic, it's divisive, it's negative. 
uh, like Donald Trump said, uh, uh, we're a nation in decline, and whose fault is it? The Chinese and the Mexicans, now it's the Germans too. And here's the cure, build a wall and uh, raise tariffs. Uh, that's a great narrative uh, from a uh, political communication point of view. Confronting that with facts is a lot more complicated. May I? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> this is true indeed, but um, in, case of, in case of Donald Trump, do the people, the people, people do know that he wants to build a wall. Do they know how much it will cost and who will pay for that? Does, does it matter? <laughs> they, they, they it don't. Matter? Um, Do they want to know? It may not matter for some, however, um, we as a group stand for knowing what you're voting for. If you know that, that um, a claim is wrong and still believe in it, then this is all your thing. Nothing wrong with this. However, you should be able to get access to uh, very um, trustworthy facts and information to at least get to know that, that something isn't true, even if it doesn't matter to you. You should know that um, a claim is, is just not fulfilling or incorrect. I think we have some questions. There are some more questions from the audience. There are a lot of questions from the audience, so we collect some more. There's the cube. Can you pass it on? Over there. Over here. Over there. Thank you. Um, so we're talking about populists and people that vote populist um, parties normally don't rely on facts, they rely on their emotions, how they feel about something. Because uh, like the other group said, or you also, um, populists play with fears and bring fears out to people and bring the simple uh, solution to everything. Um, so my question is, how do you want to approach these people who just, uh, um, rely their vote on their emotions, how they feel about something, about, uh, on their fears. Um, because normally those people um, don't really care about the facts or don't um, uh, put much weight to that when they vote. So um, this kind of, uh, yeah, I would say not, not the protest voters, but uh, those people, how do you want to approach to them with your workshops or what do you want to do to that? Thank you very much. We're going to collect some more because we don't have that much time. Perhaps just throw it into the very back of the room. There are two. Um, I have two questions. At first, you asked us why our target group are youth. And so we're asking you why you took the focus on older people. Because you showed uh, Brexit and there was a, show percent, a short percentage of young people going to the election or voting, and isn't it important to look at these people, making them interested in voting, in politics, and showing them the, the importance of voting? And second question, how do you get people to download such an app or to use these workshops? Because people who are already interested, they inform themselves about politics, but how you get people, other people interested in such things? Because they won't download such an app. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one third, a third person here up Yes, front. so the last oh, thing about the app. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we go for four questions. No, go for it. Last thing about the app. Well, you stated that the biggest problem is that especially elderly people will vote right wing or populist parties and you want to solve the problem with the app. But especially elderly people don't have a smartphone or don't know how to use it, so they won't download that app. Okay, I think that was the idea with the workshops, but just pass it on up front here. It's the same question. It's the same question. Okay, yeah, thank the you. Then we'll the just play it back. So we had just a. How much time do we still have? Five more minutes. So let's take this question here too. Just throw the cube, please, into that. All right. Oh, wow. Did anybody get hurt? <laughs> okay. Well, my question is about the app. So you said that it's actually better to just check the app before um, and go into the ballot instead of just reading the party program. Well, in the app, as far as I have understood, you have reduced the party program into a few statements. And by reducing information, you're 
you're going to probably take out all the complexity away and 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 put a narrative to it just as just as said before so isn't that also a bit dangerous okay thank you very much so let me briefly wrap up the a uh, huge amount of questions that we had here. So the first one was, how do you address a narrative that is emotionally loaded with fact-checking? I think the second question was, why, do you, um, why don't you focus more on young people? Um, and that was also echoed by another person here. And the last question was, aren't you also portraying or catering more for a simplistic notion of party programs if you reduce things in the party program just to a small sentence in a nap? Um, to start with your question, because I remember it the best, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, you claim that we tell people to not read the party program, which we do not want anyone to do. We do not want anyone to just rely on a simple application made by some teenagers. But of course it can help you and it concentrates all the most important parts of the the party programs of the uh, parties. And of course you should read the program of the party you want to vote for, but our app just helps you to recheck and to see what you're actually doing. Some of the party programs are pages long, maybe you don't even, or no offense to anyone, but maybe some people don't even understand every single word that's in there. And that just kind of helps, so. That's just supporting. Um, you know, in education there is um, there, there is a, a word for this. It's called a uh, 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 didactic reduction, uh, didaktische Reduktion in German, um, which is if you reduce a topic um, because it would be too complex to uh, just explain all of it. Um, therefore, yes, it may influence uh, some people, but this influence is so little. And they could, if, if they uh, come suspicious of us, they, they can prove, uh, um, uh, or they can check uh, via the original program. Um, however, it is not possible to just like take a whole program into to just an app. Uh, it is possible, but it's it's boring, and nobody will actually use it. Uh, what was the the, the other two questions, yeah. please? So yeah, my question about why you were not—it um, was perceived as, a, as if you were more focusing on elderly than on younger people. Um, and the emotional narrative. The emotional narrative. The emotional narrative lost. Okay. Um, so the focus on elderly people, the mild focus, because you may not forget that that we aim to to the app, and, and an app is nothing for the older generation. I, I claim I can't prove because we don't have statistics for that. Uh, however, I would would claim that uh, most elderly people do not use uh, a smartphone uh, or mobile apps. Um, so we focused on informing them, despite them not being able to uh, research the information digitally. So we did the workshops. The younger people who should be encouraged to vote, uh, to come to the other part of the question, um, is who we try to, uh, to reach out for um, via the workshops um, in the schools. Um, because downloading the app, yes, for somebody who does not care about politics, probably no option, but he will first um, probably not vote anyway, way, or secondly, it is quite unreachable. However, workshops, um, especially in, in schools, uh, like um, uh, our pre previous group, uh, you uh, very self uh, presented to us, um, can be used to to like like uh, to light these this this interest, uh, especially uh, in the younger generation, without any taking any influence on them, just um, getting them interested in democracy. Democracy. And the last one was the. Um, to your question, we cannot influence people's emotions. I think that's impossible and I don't think anybody should do that. But everybody's emotion is based on some facts or stuff you think you know. And we just tell people what are actual things or actual facts. To, and now coming to the party programs, maybe people vote a certain party because they just like one certain thing and they're, they're just, that's the one thing they're all about, but they don't know what the party also has to say. 
our example number one er, all the time here is the AFD, which is a really good example for everything that we talk about. A lot of people vote for the AFD because of the foreigners and refugees coming in, but a lot of people don't even know what the party else does else to you. Like, um, hmm? yeah. For example, older people sometimes, or a lot of older people vote the AFD, like my grandparents, for example, but they don't even know what they want to do with the money you get. Pensions. Pension. Your, your pension. You know, when you're old, you stop working, you get money, yeah. And they don't even know that the AFD doesn't want to give you a lot of that pension. So that's what we do. We just talk about people, talk about these things. We inform people, and they might might change their opinion. They might not. We cannot influence people's feelings. Thank you very much. So I would like to end this session with a very brief statement from our experts, kind of a recommendation. What would you say? I mean, there are so many young people here in the room. What is what is their contribution to actually fighting populism, or at least um, facing populism as it is currently? What could they do? What do you think? Well, I would uh, first like to congratulate you for this great impetus to bring more rationality back to the political system. And I would, um, I would suggest that you directed this, uh, this impetus uh, rather to, uh, to issues but not to parties. Because my sense is that parties are really a declining force as we've seen uh, in recent elections in Germany, for instance, uh, but that issues are becoming way more um, of, uh, of a problem. Uh, issues that uh, arise all of a sudden. For instance, the anti-TTIP movement in Germany uh, that came up, that popped up really uh, without anybody noticing up front. So, and this is uh, essentially about globalization and all the feelings that uh, go with it. And, and it has nothing to do with traditional party politics, but it changed. Uh, of official politics. So when you want to do something about European integration and so forth, I'd rather focus on the issues and not on parties, but use, the, use these tools. Yeah, short. Sure. Uh, I would like to encourage you to, to continue because I believe you are um, actually facing one of the most difficult challenges. Um, how can we decide or, or um, how do we know what facts are and how do we communicate them? It's much more easier to be a populist and it's also much more fun because you don't need to take care about facts or sources. You can just say whatever you want. It's so much easier for marketing to, to promote your political positions as we have seen with Trump and his statements. So staying to facts, it's the difficult path, but you should try to, continues, um, to continue to communicate and to work on this path. Um, I would like to add that you do have a voice which is already a privilege uh, in itself and if you decide to use it, it's very good that you want to use it after informing yourselves about what you're voting for. And if you want to convince people of ideas, um, it's always about the story so you can write the story. That's how you can influence uh, other people, change the narrative. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to abuse my position to um, have a, some of a recommendation for you too. So I would really um, also encourage you to try to always have the better argument, engage in discussion, know the positions of your potential adversaries in a political debate and get political, get engaged and try to fight for whatever position you find important and that basically applies to everybody. So I would like Final word is yours. Um, you have a chance not to give your pitch that is going to be done tomorrow. You can just uh, have a final word on the discussion and whatever you want to share with regard to your app. Uh, final word on the discussion. Um, while there are problems uh, in our country and in the EU and in the world, um, and we definitely have to tackle them, um, just, just denying everything and also coming to the point where we deny facts is not the way, it's never the way. Uh, for us it's, as students, it is way easier uh, to, to get in touch um, with the people uh, and not the governments. Um, structures are hard to change, um, people are more accessible, it's easier to engage in a discussion uh, than to, um, to rapidly also deny a structure. Um, so 
I think our very point, the, the, very, the very base of what we try to tell here is that um, a discussion that happens with storytelling indeed, but without facts, is, is not really a discussion. It's, it's a, a clash of opinions um, without any, any rational begging, uh, backing, and that is what we try to change with apps for the youth, with workshops for the old, um, and uh, with a political motivation for everybody. Thanks. Thank you very much for this enthusiastic speech.